Were you going to take him out with a, a sniper rifle or something like this? No, we were just going to go in there and do a house clearing attack on it, fighting in a built up area, if you want to call it that, um, with a gunship covering it. We had the whole place colour coded. Peter, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you very much yourself. Yes. What? Oh, oh, sorry. We've got smoke. We've got smoke. That's <laughs> first time that's happened in a podcast. Um, yes, I'm wonderful. Um, just thinking it's our mutual friend, Alison, we've got to thank for putting us in touch. So thank you. Um, thank you, Alison. She's been very helpful. Yeah. Yes. And um, after she gave me a few of your details, Peter, <laughs> I did a bit of research. And yes, you've lived uh, an interesting life, should we say? Well, depends. <laughs> to me, it was just something that rolled out in front of me as I went along, you know. Yeah, I'm the same, mate. Um, we just live our lives, don't we? And yeah if i think if we condensed everything that we'd done it wouldn't be that much i mean if our life is this big all our ac action stuff is probably squeezed into about that much of it the rest is yeah. the rest is sat around watching telly or eating or sleeping or <laughs> yeah doing a boring job to get money for the next next adventure and you were born in glasgow peter yes Mm. And joined the parachute regiment. I joined the parachute regiment when I was 17 and a half, yes. Yeah, how did that how did that come around? Well, I was uh, I ran away from home and I was living in Aberdeen. I was working on the docks and uh, one of the chaps I was working with had been an ex-RSM in the artillery. And he sort of encouraged me and I asked him about the army. And But I'd always thought about joining it anyway. So um, I joined the army in Market Street in Aberdeen. And a, the chap tried to get me to get into the Gordon Highlanders, which is the local regiment. But um, I opted for the parachute regiment. Are you, are you a proud para then? Because they've got some... Some history, those boys, haven't they? Part of the maroon machine. <laughs> what was the what was the jumps course like back then? Was it the same one I would have done when I was in the Marines? Yeah, the same one. Is it? I don't know if you've done the balloon jump, but we we did two balloon jumps and they followed by aircraft jumps. Yeah, that balloon jump is um. A bit of a bottle test, eh? <laughs> Did you ever see anybody refuse to do it? I never actually witnessed a person, but there was a person um, on my course uh, refused, and he, he was gone. I mean, before, he, you know, there was the embarrassment factor. By the time he got back to camp, he was on his way. Yeah, uh, when... I, I never actually witnessed it. I'd, we'd moved away somewhere. We'd done a two jumps for that morning and we'd moved off. Yeah, I remember um, I remember one of the Gurkhas didn't want to jump out of the Hercules. Yeah. And he was like a cat in the doorway had his arms and legs out straight on the door and the, uh, the, the PJIs just had to peel his grip off and then just throw him out. <laughs> yeah. the, I think the good thing about the parachute regiment is guys join it to parachute. You know, they know it's part of the job, so you, you normally get a good bunch of guys who are up for it. Yes. Did you... 
yeah i mean of course and it's after you've done that first one it's quite like there's no nerves or fear anyway is there you you just crack on with it and i i i found the whole thing exciting you know i i was obsessed with parachuting since i was a kid and now i was getting a chance to do it for free yes where did you serve with the paras peter um cyprus aden um i was at cyprus and aden mm. But, uh, and Bahrain, sorry, Bahrain as well. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of what conflicts you were involved in and, and why and, and and what happened? Well, I, I was I was involved in uh, Borneo. I was involved in Aden. Uh, I was involved uh, with the United Nations in Cyprus. Um, that, for Cyprus was the first time I'd ever been shot at. Um, but it was ineffective fire, you know, that we, it was a, a half hour ambush and we just drove through it. Yeah. No one got hit. No one at all. Effective enemy fire, isn't it, when someone gets hit? Other I, than that, it's just, it, it's nothing. Yeah. And what was the what what was the conflict about there? Can you explain for our friends at home that might not know? Well, when I went to Cyprus, there was uh, the Turks and the Greeks were fighting each other over. It was historical who who owned part of the island and and whatnot. And eventually, uh, I was there at the very beginning of it, and I was there for six months. And then we left. And then after we left, the Turks invaded the island. You know. Peter, can I just say, I think you're tapping on your device. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry. I, um, it, it's coming across on the, it quite quite loud. Um, yeah. Are you able to put it down on something, or is that is that going to be difficult? No, okay. Oh, I, you, I've got the message. I'll be okay. Yeah, okay. Brilliant. Um, yes, in Aiden, what... Can you explain for us what was Aiden around? Because you hear this from the from the older veterans a lot about Aiden, and and for for our younger friends, yeah, it, it's going to be all forgotten, isn't it? Yeah, the, the the group out there, the terrorist, not a terrorist group, a dissident group, was um, a Federation for the Liberation of Southern Yemen, Flossy it was called, and they they were trained by the Egyptians up in um, up in North Yemen. And um, they came into the south, and uh, there was a bit of an in insurrection around the the Radfan area, and uh, they brought uh, the Paras in, the SES, and uh, one of the Anglian battalions. I think there were some Marines involved as well, and they sorted the the initial situation out, but it carried on for up until 1967. And did 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 you see much action there? Uh, skirmishes and uh, long distance firing. Uh, I had one close up contact, and it, when I say close up, um, the guy was about four or five feet away. Wow! Um, um, did you have to shoot him? Yes, I did. Uh, basically, we, the troop sergeant was up front. And I was the interpreter at the time. And uh, he called me forward. He says, there's some shepherds there. And I noticed they were sort of lying in a straight row. And I, I became fairly suspicious. And this guy woke up and shot the troop sergeant. And then I shot him. And then it just kicked off. Um, we had two guys wounded. And we had um, we killed five of them. How old were you then? Uh, 22. Mm -hmm. That's quite a young age, isn't it, to be involved in something so serious? I just wish I'd have been involved earlier on because the, I feel the army's sometimes not worth being in if you're not, if you're not fighting. In that, you know, you get back to the UK and 
you get these maniacs running about looking for things to paint and places to do drill, you know. Um, it was never my forte. Um, a big part of soldiering, but I, I didn't see it that way. Yeah, they call it active service for a reason, don't they? Because you're, yeah. you're pretty active. and We used to call it the guys. It, it was funny because the... The guys used to go abroad and there'd be people left behind and they seemed to be a type of man. Um, you'd go away, get yourself involved in a skirmish or whatever it was. You'd come back and this guy has been promoted one rank up, ready to whip you back into shape. <laughs> Standing with a pace stick, ready to rattle you up and down the square. And Peter, how did you... How did the SAS come around? Was that something you'd always wanted? No, I, I, I was in the, de in the depot and I, I looked out the window and there was a guy standing there and his face looked as if it was, you know, made out of leather, very deeply tanned. And he was awful, awful. To me, he was an old man. Um, I met the guy later on, but he was in his late. An old man to me then was anybody who was over 30. I mean, I'm only 17, and uh, but he was a troopy, and I couldn't understand this because anybody who was older in the parish regiment were sergeants and sergeant majors, and I seen this guy and I, I said, "Who are they?" And the chap says, "Oh, they're the SAS," and I found out about a bit about them, and I eventually asked for the transfer there. And was the selection back then the same as it is now? This kind of grueling. It was. It was hard. I. I. I by no means shone on the selection. I mean, I did it and I passed it. But it'd be wrong to say I'd, I'd done it with flying colours. You know, I. I got through it. That's what counted to me. And did you see much action with the SAS? Yeah, um, we were doing an awful lot in Aden at that time. And we were doing uh, an awful lot of reconnaissance in Borneo. So you had a fairly exciting uh, turnaround. You did a trip to Aden, a trip to Borneo, a trip to the UK to, for retraining. And you, you were on the go the whole time. Uh, Aden, we were getting fairly involved with skirmishes there. It'd be wrong to say there were pitched battles. It was sort of long distance shooting. Um, and, you know, we'd return fire and we'd go and see if there was any bodies and you'd find the odd one here and there. Did you, did you, did you have many casualties yourself? Um, well, I was there, there was uh, two, two dead and I made a couple of wounded. We, 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 we always had the upper hand with them. Don't forget, we had the, we had the assets to go with it. You know, if, if things get too heavy, you just called in the choppers. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, the gunships were in their infancy then, but uh, they could give you some support. But, you know, we got to know the terrain just as, just as well as the people who lived there because we were working there all the time. We knew where water was. You know, there'd be water catchment pools at places. Um, so you weren't carrying gallons of water with you like it was in the early days. Yes. That water's heavy, isn't it? Yeah, well, the first stop I did, we were carrying two gallons of water each, and we were in one-gallon containers. Um, and it was heavy, you know, it was, you know, we all, all your ammunition, your rations, everything, it was a fairly heavy pack. So... What is it then that sets the the SAS trooper apart from the the regular forces? Well, I'd like to say something here. The good guys in the SAS are no better than the good guys anywhere else in the army or in the forces. It's just just that through a selection process, there should in theory be less bad guys. So you, you've got a lot of people there who who are they want to do it, they want to be involved in it. And consequently, they, they finish up getting roped in and, and doing the business. 
yes, it seems to appeal to people that love to be a professional soldier. Is is that fair to say? Yeah, well, it's a, it's sort of it's a pinnacle, isn't it? As I said, the good guys there are no better than the good guys somewhere else. I met an awful, awful lot of professional soldiers uh, when I was stationed at Brecon. Good, good, solid infantrymen who knew their trade all the way through. Um, but, you know, the SES sometimes attracted the better elements of the army. Yes. Yes. Was it... Uh... Could any? Could all the other forces, all the other services, apply for the SCS back then? Was that a modern thing? No. Yeah. The um, they started. Um, it was mainly army. Then there was a couple of guys came from the RAF regiment, and then later on uh, the nautical types came along. You know, and then with guys who, it was hard to come from the Marines to the Paris. So what the average Marine did at that time. Just come out of the army and rejoin the SES. Yeah. Yes, come out of the Navy if you're a Marine and, and then yeah. re reapply. And they assign you a, a sort of tokenistic regiment, don't they? Yeah. So if you're a Marine, you generally assign you, you, your, your army regiment becomes the paras then. Yeah. Yeah. What's the... Um, I don't know if I'm touching on dodgy ground here, mate, but it on your Wikipedia page is some, it says some st stuff about disciplinary. Um, I, I, I think I've got a chance to put that straight. I, was, I wasn't a bad soldier. I was a badly behaved soldier. You get some people feel they can take, take your right to be called a soldier away from you because you were badly behaved. Uh, my problem lay when I, I mixed alcohol with uh, with myself and it didn't agree. <laughs> uh, consequently, I I get into more of my more than a share share of fights. I was never disciplined in the army for army reasons. It was always for what happened outside the camp. Yeah, I can believe it. Um, is it fair to say a lot of people growing up in Glasgow have a very tough upbringing and alcohol becomes quite a major factor later in? Well, I, I, can, I can only um, speak for the area I came from. And most disputes, and it's, uh, you don't, I never found this out till later in life. Most dis disputes there were solved through fighting. If you fell out with each other, you get two, you, you, two guys fought it out. If they weren't happy with the result on a Saturday night, it was normally a Saturday, you know, um, after the football and stuff like that. And if they weren't happy with the result, they'd have what was called a comeback, whereas they'd meet each other the next morning or the next week and settle the difference. But the great thing about it was when it was settled, it was settled. There was no animosity held after it. There was no grudges, you know, and, uh, and everything just carried on. Mm. what's it like if I may ask then because I've very probably narrowly avoided prison myself in this lifetime I think anyone who's a bit of a boy who's lived a bit has walked walk that sort of line at one point or another Yeah, but I've often wondered what's it like for a serviceman when you come from this sort of disciplined environment um, and then you, if you find yourself in prison, yes, is that an easy, easy is probably not the right word, but is it, is that an easy transfer for a service person to make, or is it absolutely horrible? No, I, I, I found it, I, I, I disliked the place, the, the discipline within the prison I could take, it was the depth that some of the guys had sank to in there. You had all types, all various types out there. And some of them were professional at their own game. Um, you know, there were professional con men, professional uh, antique thieves. And then you got the, you know, the, the lesser elements who had always been grassed or something, as they put it. 
Um, and a lot of them were role playing. They, 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 you know, they they'd get there and play the hard man because they weren't scared of losing remission. Whereas the average person that went in there, um, he was he just wanted to get out. Can you see it? But you got there was that element in there who, to them, prison was status. Um, I had an incident one day where one chap tried to bully me, and uh, and I pulled him into the. I was in charge of the bike shop. I pulled him in, hit him a few slaps, and he ran out. And and in front of the actual warder who was there, he started going, "Come on, come on, let's see how hard you are now." And the warder just looked, and he could see me, and he walked off to the toilet, and left me with this guy on my own. So, it, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I just finished up battering him and and, and left it at that, you know. Um, I, I, what I did find that a lot of the guys let themselves down in there. You know, they, you know, there's your self-esteem. Um, you know, you mustn't let it go. Um, and you're in there for a reason. And as, as I often say, if you can't pay the price, don't roll the dice. So I finished up there. I accepted it. Um, it was a learning process for me. If I could could meet the judge who actually sent me away. I think he'd shake his hand. Um, I don't think it was any do we get this thug off the streets. I think it was they said you need some breathing space, you know. Yeah, it can be uh it can be a bit of a wake up call, can't it? Yeah. Being suddenly being in that environment and thinking, oh dear, I'm gonna lose my liberty here. Yeah. Um, I guess when it becomes just an occupational hazard and you accept it, that's where the the lifetime of criminality comes in, isn't it? You know, as I say, there were some. I met some decent people and decent people, but you know they've been um, deemed by society to be criminals. But some of them were for various reasons, and and you had that element. All they wanted to do was do the time, get out, and get on with their life. You had the other element, as I say, uh, they were a bit unlivable with, you know. Uh, I found them hard to, to be with, you know. And I, 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 this is not putting myself above them. I, I can only speak for myself, but I just found them hard to live with. Yes. I mean, I spent, I spent a weekend there listening to a guy who came into my cell and he'd been in the Paris. And he must have killed he must have killed more Indians than John Wayne over the weekend. And he'd never been in the Paris. You know, he'd invented a background for himself. Can you see it? Yeah, and when I, people chat like that with me, I just smile and listen and and um, I, I feel really I feel for them. A lot of yeah. people get really upset about it, don't they? But I don't. I just think. I had a guy once, I was on a night out and I jumped in a taxi with this boat and he turned me around, yeah, I was in the Marines and I was like, all right. I didn't, I didn't mention my military history. Yeah. And he went, yeah, I was, uh, served at the Citadel, right? Well, anyone that knows and, and your, our friend Rusty knows this, the Citadel is 2-9 commando, they're, they're gunners. Yeah. They like, okay, they're part of three commando brigade, fair enough, but it was just a bit bit it was just a bit sad the way this guy was he thought that if he said he was a m- marine, that was more kudos yeah. than saying he was a gunner, and it of course it's yeah. all a bit it all gets a bit silly. I I I laugh at some of these guys, you know, they, 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 we call them we call them Walter Mitties or Walters for short. And you know, there's, there was one cat chap they caught in Birmingham here. He'd, he'd meddled, he, he looked like a, a South American general, you know. He'd medals for officers and men's medals because you, the officers used to get the MC and their medal system was different at that time. And he had two rows of them wearing an SAS berry. And he eventually got pulled in under some act. And the guy was in his probably at 
early 60s, late 50s. And what he was trying to do was impress his girlfriend. And, you know, I, I refused to get upset about her because I, I actually <laughs> find them funny, you know. Mm. You get guys that are really upset, so I, I don't see it. You know, there's stolen honour and whatnot. You're going to get them, whether, whether you have the law or whether you don't have it, you're still going to have these chaps dressing up, you know. Yeah. The way I see it, it's a mental illness. And if you're going to attack these people, then you're the kind of person that attacks disabled people. And that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't make mean that you, you've got a very balanced balance. It's different, these lads that dress up and they go and collect money with a tin. That That's a different yeah. thing, you know. I've, I've, yeah. I've challenged them in the high street and gone, you haven't served. What, why, what? Oh, yeah, what it is, a quid from this magazine goes to military. Ch it's like, does it, yeah. does it bugger, you know? That's a, that's a different thing, you know, pretending to be a serviceman to commit a crime. But if you pretend to be a serviceman because you're mentally unwell, yeah, uh, you 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 need help and support. You don't need big, tough military thugs like threatening to kill you. Um, I I, uh, I mean I I've got medals from three different armies, and I stopped wearing them because uh, I'd go and own you know I'd go to the odd parade and that, and guys would be pointing them, watch that, and they're twisting the medal around to see if your name is on it, you know. <laughs> And I, I started feeling a wee bit embarrassing, you know. Hey, they'd, they'd have a job with me, Peter, because I bought mine off eBay. And I, <laughs> I'm not joking, seriously. My, my Northern Ireland medal, I, 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 I think it's in my lad's bedroom somewhere. I, I, yeah. But when I went to one of these, um, I, I think it was some reunion or it might have been the Sergeant Blackman um protests or whatever we were calling them marches and, and suddenly i had to get a medal and you can buy the northern ireland one on ebay so i i just bought one of them <laughs> i didn't i didn't want to wear it but i didn't know whether like i had to wear it so i had it just tucked in my pocket and I, I i i never i never wore it but um yes yeah, interesting so can we oh what i wanted to ask is when you're in the prison, all sort of the other prisoners go, that guy, SAS, like, we'll leave him alone, you know, don't don't mess with this guy. No, I, I, I didn't have any of that. I, I was very fortunate. I met an ex-Marine in there, and he was into the weights. You know, he was a, really into weight training. And I sort of teamed up with him, and he used to, I'd, I did all free, freestanding training up till then. And he introduced me to the weights, you know, and uh, that that was that was my sort of buddy the whole time I was in there. But mainly I was on my own, you know. Hmm. Yes, like um, maybe like getting through selection was it? Keep your head down and be the grey man. I just I just got get on with it, you know. And the the guys used to come up and see me, you know, some of my mates, you know, and the. Uh, you know, the, the old the old rewarders would say, who are those guys? You know, they you know, a couple of them are fairly heavy built, you know, they they looked apart, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one stage, um, you know, some of the paras came up to see me as well. It was uh, it was people I hadn't seen for years, but they thought he's got himself locked up there, I think I'll go and see how he is, you know. Yes. Moving on, I'm just making a couple of notes here as we as we go, mate. Um, what was it like when you saw the Iranian embassy siege and and the, and the hostage hostage rescue on on the television? Did it did it all sort of come flooding back to you? Did you did you wish you were still serving? No, I, I was in the South African Army when that happened. I was up in Angola. And we got a couple of newspaper articles through. And uh, I was with the South African Army. And, I, you know, I looked at it and then I, I managed to uh, get some stuff on it. And, you know, to me, it was very a very clinical thing. Well carried out and well executed. Did you know any of the guys that were on that, that 
that operation. Oh, I knew quite a few of them, yeah. Yeah. Are we allowed to say any names that are in the in the public? Well, I knew Rusty. I'd met him a few times. Um, um, and some of the guys on the balcony, I knew them to talk to you in the pub, you know, just say hello and move on, you know. Mm. Rusty's always trying to borrow a pair of gloves off people, isn't he? <laughs> Rusty's the man with no gloves. I'm the man with no hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no comment. Yeah. Yes. Angola. My gosh, what, what a country that has seen utter bloodshed for so many years. Currently in in peace, but it's all looking like it's kicking off down there in Africa again. Yeah. So Angola, Angola the, the, I think the Portuguese had 13 years of insurgency there. And the Mozambique and Angola are two of the few colonies that the mother country just went, you've got it, you've got your freedom. You know, we're out of it. And they, they pulled out and it just kicked off a civil war, mm -hmm. which in actual fact was fairly brutal. Um, then the South Africans came in and tried to um, sort a few things out to get the people in power that would be friendly to them. And Russia was heavily involved, weren't they? Russia, Chinese, you know. Um, it was just a... It was a wake-up call to me. I mean, I've never seen things like that in my life, you know. There was just... There was a bridge there, and underneath the bridge there was just piles of dead bodies where people had been... They seemed to take them to this bridge, shoot them in the back of the head and throw them over the bridge. You know, and it was a shallow pool underneath it, and it was just lying there rotten, you know. Um, it was it was a funny, funny situation. You know, you had the MPLA, uh, which was the communist side, you had the FNLA, and you had UNITA. Um, the FLA, FNLA was very influential in the north, and eventually the Cubans came in, aided the MPLA, and started pushing everybody back. Um, so that's where the South Africans then came into it. It was, yeah. Um, yeah. I worked in Mozambique, so I was there, I suppose you say, picking up the pieces after the, the Civil War. I worked with street children. Yeah. In a, in a school in a place called Nakala. Yeah. And of course, the whole country's riddled with landmines. Mm. When the Portuguese pulled out, they filled all the sewers with concrete just to spite to spite the locals because they the Portuguese were obviously losing their uh, their place in paradise and they didn't like it, so they blocked up all the sewers. So everywhere you went, it just stunk because there weren't you know there weren't any toilets. Um, quite funny. I think I was saying this to somebody the other day. And it, it was a shame because both. Angola and the Mozambique were beautiful countries. Mm. I mean, I was flying along the Rhodesian Mozambique border one day and I looked, and Rhodesia was just as it was then, it then became Zimbabwe after it, but it was flying along the border, and you could see that Rhodesia was totally green. And as soon, there was a border fence there, and the other side, it was just dead. It was, you know, independence has a price and I think probably some of the colonial powers made a bit, bit of a mistake they should have been getting these people ready for independence before they actually seized it so they um, so normally what happens you get the people who have got the guns are getting in power and the people who have got any experience of politics they can find themselves getting shot yeah, it's been bloody, isn't it? I mean, the C Congo comes to mind for just utter, utterly horrific violence for years and years. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's... <sighs> Africa's an exciting place. It, it is. It's, it's also a beautiful place. And, you know, South Africa, for its many faults, has managed to keep an element of stability. 
um, may have been may have not gone down the right road and and uh, holding it that keeping it that way, but she lasted longer than anybody else. And what's it like being a mercenary then, Peter? What there's a bit of there's a lot of kind of mystique about that, isn't there? Maybe that's not not the right word. But to, to, to be honest, uh, I think there's a lot of bullshit myself. You know, they, you get guys there who are, you know, they're, they're security guards somewhere. They're, they're mercs, not mercenaries, mercs, you know. The last mercenary operation that, that I knew of was with Mike Horn in the Congo. Uh, I'm, I'm not up in any more of it, but, you know, it's, it's a team, it's a term that's bandied about by the, the press. You know, and it, um, it either glamorizes the people or demonizes them, you know, depending on what paper it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I bet you get some right knobheads, don't you? You, you know, like um, I, when I was in Angola, there was a kid there turned up, and he, he, he wasn't a bad kid. I mean, but he, he, who, whoever sent him out there, you know, and I said, why are you here, son? He was 17 years old. He said, I want to get my mother a television. Don't forget the season 76. And I, I just looked on, but, you know, as long as he was with uh, with people that mattered, uh, he, he would he would take instruction and go along and do his bit. He didn't lack enthusiasm. But it was just that it was a strange excuse, excuse to get yourself involved in a civil war, you know. I want to buy my mummy a television. And is there, when you're fighting in these sort of conflicts as a mercenary, it, it, is there a general lack of rules, like you can do what you want, or is it is it just run along the same lines as the military? And, and how do the people behave? Um, a lot of them get very taken in with a movie image, you know, what you should be in that. Uh, dressing up, upside down knives on the, on the, on the webbing and whatnot. Um, the only way you run a mercenary operation is run it like the people who've got the experience at it. And that's the army or the military. Um, there's, there's no quick way around it. You don't get helicopters all flying in from different directions. Schwarzenegger gets out of one, Stallone gets the other. Some other guy comes out there shaving himself with a blue razor blades and uh, they get together and they just jail and get into the jungle and wipe, wipe out half of humanity. You know, it's, it's not like that. I mean, I found myself doing, you know, a, a bit of social work. You know, like I got landed in a the town there and it was, the people were starving and it was because the army was taking the food off them. Yeah, I, I can believe that. Where, was this in Angola? Yes. Yeah, the, the, I think people over here wouldn't understand the level of poverty there, would they? No, you, you've got to see it to believe it. You know, the, the thing that Africa's got going for it is the weather. So you can, you know, it's not hard to sleep in the ground outside and, and whatnot. But, you know, the, the average Angolan there, they, they were struggling along. And actual fact, they were, a, they were a decent race of people, you know. They, and, you know, they needed leadership and it wasn't there. You know, they, they, the, the whole system had collapsed during the Civil War and it was, you know, whoever was carrying the gun called the tune. What weapons did you favour then as a mercenary? What, what, is there a particular assault rifle that people want to get their hands on or do you just get get what you're given no i i've always liked to get, get my hands on an ak and that africa is riddled with them and there's, there's plenty of ammunition about for them mm -hmm. um and it's a steady old it's a solid old weapon um and that, well, that was the reason i i favored it when i was in the Rhodesian army and we were doing cross-border operations uh in one case there, I came out with more ammunition than I jumped in with. Because, it was, you know, you, it, 
it was lying all over the place where guys just drop it and run. Does it fire, is it called a short round, the, the Kalashnikov? Let's see, the, um, it's, it's a seven six two round. Yeah. But the, the FN, which was the British Army weapon at the time, or the SLR, was 76259 uh, or five, five something. And the, the uh, Kalashnikov was um, more along the lines of a, a M16 round. Can you see it? I mean, yeah. the, the thing is with the FN round, when you hit somebody with one of them, they went down. You know, it was a. I think it was see seven six two five nine. I think it was a it was a, a hefty weapon. Um, the only thing is, with the, both the AK and the M sixteen, you could carry a great greater battle load than you could with the FN because the FN ammunition was fairly heavy mm. compared with the the later versions of the 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 armor light and whatnot. Peter, can you tell us any, um, any any episodes from? Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, Rhodesia in a yeah. moment, but from your mercenary work, what 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 were the kind of hot hot moments? I um, I was driving along a road, and I noticed there was a hat lying on the road. Those Portuguese uh, combat hats. And I stopped next to it. And I went to pick up the hat and I went, I was right on the edge of an ambush. I wasn't in it, I was on the edge of it. So I just behaved normally. I got <laughs> I got the truck. I've never seen a, a land rover <laughs> reversing as fast as that. I must have been doing doing about 60 miles an hour. Anyway, I got myself out of it. Yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> so, Rhodesia then, which is now latter-day Zimbabwe, was uh, Ian Smith was the president back then, wasn't he? Back yeah. in the 70s. And he said, he's uh, one of the last countries to relinquish its colonialism. Yeah. And Ian Smith said, if we give this country back, it will just go to bloodshed um, or, or greed or corruption, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, Mugabe took over, didn't he? Yes. So they had a puppet or a very, can we say, a suspicious leader for, 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 for the next God knows how many years until yeah. Mugabe. He's dead now, isn't he? Yeah. Um, so were you there under Ian Smith or was... Yes, I was. Uh, I was there when it was Rhodesia. And then for a while, it became Zimbabwe Rhodesia. And then was another transformation period, but it became Southern Rhodesia again, which was the original colony. And then it became Zimbabwe. Wow. And, uh, and a lot of Rhodesians... I, couldn't recognise the Southern Rhodesian flag. It went up for a couple of months, you know, and then they, the elections took place and Mugabe got in power. Um, the, the Rhodesians tried in their own way to get a balance, but by then the damage had been done. There'd been 15 years of war. Um, the nationalists got in power, and that was the end of it. Um, it went not too, when I say it's not the end of it, it went not too bad for a few years, and then it just slid downhill. And Peter, you were you were in the spe Rhodesian Special Air Service. Yes. Um, the South African Police Special Branch. Yeah. And the South African Defence Force uh, 44 Parachute Brigade. Yeah. 
This is a very colourful military career, isn't it? Um, well, as I say, it just happened. I just as things were changing, I just moved on. Um, I was offered a job with a working working with. I was never in the special branch. I, I was working with the special branch wing of the Salu Scouts. I was neither a scout nor in the special branch, but I was just a, a contractor um, who worked for them. And how does the Rhodesian SES compare to its English counterpart? Is it is it very similar or, or is it? They, 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 they had all the same aims. It's just that the, the guys there were younger. Um, they were a lot younger and, you know, they were, I mean, I, I, people said I didn't like Rhodesian. You know, it's, it's, it's not true. I just didn't understand them. It was the schooling system. You know, the... Everybody, they're very proud of the schools. I went to Guinea Fool, I went to Plum Tree, you know, and did they, and they had this habit of wearing their school socks with a, a underneath their camouflage. I, I, I don't know where it came from, but um, you know, you get the odd guy who you just his, his camouflage would slip back. You see a a Guinea Fool or a Plum Tree hose top, you know. <laughs> um, I think uh, a lot of that, come in. Sorry, I've just had someone come to the door, Chris. That's fine. Yeah, see you later. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Um, yeah, the, 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 as I say, they were a lot younger, but Rhodesia, what they actually did they, they were taking men from the RLI in different units. And they, they, there wasn't that SES thought pattern as they saw it. So they, they do a selection course and then come into the, into the squadrons and learn in the squadrons. And then they adopted this, right, let's get them from the start, from school, and let's get them thinking like SES men from the beginning. And... Um, I was used to SES guys being older, in the, like in the British SES, but um, it worked there. And those kids, they, they really picked it, and they were intelligent as well. I mean, they, they were good at picking up things like Morse and, um, you know, all the other skills like demolitions, mortars, machine guns. Uh, they, they were very fast on the uptake. And on the whole, it was a, it was a good unit. Hmm. And what, I'm trying to think of a, a, a question that our friends at home would um, be wanting me to ask. So what, can you give us an idea of what action you saw, you saw with them? What, what, what were the fights about? And... Are you talking about in the bush? Yes. Uh, the thing about the Rhodesian army, which had something over most other armies. You grew comfortable with combat. Most of the times you went out, you were in action. And it was, some of it was heavy, some of it was skirmishes, uh, some of it was camp attacks. Um, and the, you just grew comfortable with combat. Whereas in, when I was in the British Army, I found that all I got was a series of freights, you know. Um, Okay, you're going to such and such a place, and then you'd have to, you know, you're battling with come coming to terms with it because you've just been told and you were thinking about, you know, how you're going to go and meet your girlfriend in Glasgow in X amount of weeks' time. And so there was that, whereas the Rhodesians were at it the whole time and they 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 put their heart and soul into it. They believed in what they were doing. Um and uh, as I say the world's politics, or the politicians put pressure on them and then they had to hand over because the, there was pressure put in South Africa who put pressure on Rhodesia. Mm. And um, at one stage we were down to, I think it was 18 days ammunition. And they says, we better come to a solution. We'll try and get a solution. And like all other wars, 
the only the only thing that solves them is politicians getting together and sorting the thing out. Yeah, it's a bit hard, that isn't it? When most politicians are just cowards, and and those that aren't cowards are their hands are tied to to do anything. Well, the Rhodesia is the only country where I've been in where the politicians let the army get on with it. You know, no doubt there was a liaison between the generals and the and the politicians, but they left you to get on with it. They, they weren't worried about what so and so thought because it didn't matter to them anymore. So you had this um, this aggression to to try and bring the thing to a the war to a halt, and they put everything they had into it. Mm. Was it? Was it? It's a bit of a stupid question, but obviously it was gutting for the people when they had to relinquish control. Did they, they all were, agree? They were, but um, an awful lot of the Rhodesians were sort of second generation. They'd come out there after the war. You know, there were Brits who just emigrated there, and the lifestyle there was phenomenal. It was, I mean, it was it was fantastic. You know. Um, I mean, food was cheap, meat was cheap. And the only thing you couldn't get an awful lot of was fish, you know. Um, and uh, they started making their own booze. And uh, I remember they made this booze called, I think it was called whiskey. It was called Dumbarton or something. And you get one bottle, you could drink a bottle of it and not feel anything. Another one, if you took a little sip of it, you were on your back. <laughs> they started trying to do it themselves and... And, and to be independent of other people, you know. Mm. Peter, what's the connection with Pablo Escobar? Did I get that right? There was a connection in that I tried to kill him um, and I wasn't successful at it. Um, I was confident that we'd trained enough that we had the right calibre of person to do it. And as it happens, a mountain got in the way of, a, of my helicopter. How did, it, how did it come about? How did you set out to kill Pablo Escobar? And why? And who was funding you? Yeah. Um, Dave Tompkins, a friend of mine, came to me. Who, I'd met Dave in Angola and he was wounded there, so... I'd gone to see him in hospital a few times and uh, we sort of became friends. And Dave approached me, he says, how do you feel about going to Colombia? I says, well, what's the job? He says, to kill pa Pablo Escobar. I said, okay. And uh, we went out there and we met two businessmen. I say again, two businessmen. Um, <coughs> And uh, they asked us if we could kill Pablo Escobar. And I said, at the moment, I feel we can. And uh, I'd like to have a look at the place and see what we're going to attack. And uh, they were very, very helpful. Anything we asked them for, helicopters, weapons, they gave it to us. Um, we had a liaison officer with us called Jorge Salcedo, who, who was in the intelligence side of the army, and he handled everything for us. Um, so the that's how I became involved there. And then we said, can you do it? We said, yes. I said, okay, what do you need? Go on, we will fund you. Um, in reality, we had been talking to members of the Cali cartel, um, who Pablo Escobar had tried to kill, they tried to kill him, and it was, it looked like a war was kicking off, and they reckoned it was bad for business. So, the army was involved in it as well, and they just wanted the problem solved. They couldn't get it solved military-wise, because an awful lot of people in the military were on the payroll of Pablo Escobar. 
Mm. For example, if you flew anywhere near pa Pablo Escobar's uh, ranch, the people on the radar would report to him that there's aircraft about. So what we decided was to get up as high as we could on that, and we flew over these premises a few times. So when the radar uh, people reported it to them, it, it wasn't. It just looked like an, an aircraft passing over. But I was taking photographs all the time. How would you have killed him? What was the plan? It, it wasn't. You know, a lot of people. You know, you left wing newspapers and whatnot. See, you know, it was just a bunch of guys who got together. The guys I had there had all been in action before. There wasn't one of them who had not never been on the trigger. They'd all done it before and they'd all been used to fighting against superior numbers to themselves. Uh, we got there and we trained for 11 weeks. Now, when I was in the army, at no time did I ever get 11 weeks to train for a job. And, we, and for that 11 weeks, we trained. We, we changed every scenario that we thought was going to happen. We catered for it. We rehearsed it. We practiced it. We did a full dress rehearsal where we attacked a, a piece of ground that we, uh, we marked out in the shape of a, a Pablo's ranch. And, um, you know, so we went through all the motions of that. It wasn't some half half thing that was thrown together. And all the guys I had, were, they, were all, they were all professionals. Yes. Did they come from all, all, around, all around the world? Were they, did, did you recruit them from your previous adventures? Yeah, well, a lot of them had been in the Rhodesian Army, the South African Army. Um, and um, we had a couple of a guy from the Territorial SES um, and a couple of Australians. And were you going to take him out with a, a sniper rifle or something like this? No, we were just going to go in there and do a house clearing attack on it, fighting in a built up area, if you want to call it that, um, with a gunship covering it. We had the whole place colour coded. Each room in the place was colour coded and numbered. So everybody, as we go along, I say, what is that? That's white one, that's white two. What's the back of it called? That's black one, black two. Um, it wasn't just thrown together, a load of guys chancing it out. We, we, we had Chinese parliaments there, you know, where everybody had input. And what if this happens and somebody would come up with an idea and we'd, we'd take it. And it wasn't, it wasn't just uh, me being the boss and telling the guys what to do uh, and, and then following it. It was, they had an awful lot of input to it. How much were you going to get paid for doing this? Um, one of the movies that came out, or one of the documents that came out, said we're getting five thousand pound a month. I'm sorry, it wasn't that. That was a down payment they got for coming out there. Um, the salary was um, something like seven seven thousand dollars a month at that time, with a twelve thousand uh, dollar um, bonus if we attacked the place or $12,000 if he took off to attack the place. So, they, you know, it was, it was fairly fairly well paid. Don't forget this was many years ago. Mm. Was this round about the time Escobar, he, he went a bit mental for a stage, didn't he? And he was just blowing up everybody. He was just the, he went on the rampage, you know, because he, he actually... Um, he tried to get into politics and he got rejected. And um, and I think there was an awful lot of DEA out there at the time. And um, I think they just wanted them out of the way. And we came along as part of their solution. As Dave, Dave Tompkins often says, they let us get on with it. And they said, we'll suck it and see. At least if something happens to them, it's not happening to us. So they knew about it. Um, it was a pa Pablo had to go. It was a, it was a it, it, outside 
the city of Medellin. He was he was a sort of maniac, you know. <laughs> uh, but he did an awful lot for the people of Medellin, financed by the money he made from cocaine. He built football pitches at schools for kids, put the you know, lights so they could play football at night time. There was a, 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 that social side. But then again, as somebody said, you know, the craze used to give money to charity as well. Um, it was just the way he was. Um, and he had to go. And how long after was it that he was shot dead on that rooftop? Uh, the, the following year, I think, yeah. Gosh. What, what was your plan then, Peter, in, in all of your skirmishes, if you'd ever got caught? Because some of these people, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been... A, I'm guessing it wouldn't have been a, a very nice ending for you. Well, out of all the guys, I was the only one that landed in that actual position. And uh, as I say, I crashed in the helicopter and I was left up in 9,000 feet up in the mountain. And uh, by this time, Pablo had picked up there was something afoot and he was sending parties out and they were killing people for no reason at all. And I, I said, if they get a hold of me, I'm going to have a horrible death. And my third day when I was up in the mountain after it crashed, I could hear Spanish voices. I said to myself, well, here we go. It's time. And uh, I thought it was Pablo's boys. So I just took a grenade, I pulled a pin out, and I had a little interdynamic submachine gun. And uh, I said, well, if I go, I'll take a few with me. And that's what I genuinely thought. It's, it's, it's not moving material. I said, because if these guys get me, I'm going to die one hell of a death. So, you know, um, that was a decision I made. And as the guys came came a, upon me, they never noticed me. I was lying tucked in under a bush and I just stuck the machine gun in his, some machine gun in his stomach and he'd, he started screaming, Ricardo, Ricardo, which was one of the guys' code name. And... Uh, I then realised I was in fairly safe hands. Yeah, so, so sorry, just to clarify, that, that who was Ricardo? Was Ricardo was the army liaison officer we had with us. His name was Jorge Salcido, but his code name was Ricardo. Ah, uh, okay. And they, what, they'd come to rescue you? Yeah. That was a relief, I'm guessing. It was a relief, but I, I, was in, I was in immense pain. And what they did is they chopped down a tree. And by the time, they, they were very, very efficient. They chopped down this tree, and before I knew what it was, it looked like a telegraph pole. They cut the branches off everything. They strapped me on it, and they lowered me down, slid me down the tree trunk, um, and then moved on. They kept sliding me down, all the re entering all the way down to the bottom. It was terribly painful. Um, what 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 was actually painful? Had you had you broken bones and and, and such? I had mean, four ribs. Well, I didn't find out till later. It was four ribs smashed at the front, four at the back. Um, all my insides. I'd given the you know my heart and lungs and whatnot a terrible bashing as well. I, I, I it never. It wasn't stove chest, but it was po possibly as near as you could get to it. Um, and it was just, it was painful. And, uh, but as I say, those guys got me down and it, it was reassuring to know that I was going to get somewhere. But they were, I said, how, how long is it going to be? Eight hours, right? Uh, how long is it going to be? Eight hours. You know, as, as we've been down and we camped tonight uh, in a riverbed. And it started raining very heavily. The, the, the river flooded, so we were lying in water most of the night. <laughs> uh, and then there was a little bank where they sat on the bank. And I could I had escape money with me. And they robbed it off me. They, <laughs> they were counting, you know, split the opposite. I was there. But I was just I was just glad to be out of it. Mm. I bet. Peter. Um, can you give your books a shout out before we say goodbye? Yeah, see, 
It's a reprint of the original book, No Mean Soldier. Uh, the cover, cover is there. It's a new, new cover that's on it. And uh, we had it reprinted because it was starting to sell an awful lot again. And it came into demand quite a bit. Um, the it was a lot of people have helped me with, uh, with that book. And in actual fact, the people, well, some people that helped me were they actually came from Workington Town um, Rugby Club, and they said, "Look, we can line up a talk for you here, and we'll help you to sell your book." So they, they, they've been extremely helpful to me as well. Mm. Good. For friends at home, we'll put a link below this video for Peter's book. So I don't need to encourage you to read it, do I, after hearing this, this story? Um, it's one like no other. What, what um, Have you any social media that you want people to follow you on, Peter? Or is yeah, that the at all? www.petermichaelese.com Okay, I'll put, again, we'll put a link under the video, folks. Peter, and, uh, it, 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 it's just been amazing not just to meet you, but to hear your story, and I hope we can stay friends for a very long time. Um, and um, have you back on the show at some point, because I reckon our, our, our viewers will have a few questions that, that they'd like to put to you. Well, you know, th firstly, thanks very much for talking to me, and I'd be glad to come back on again. Um, if anything, it may help to sell some copies of my book. Yeah, that's that's what we're all about. Yeah. <laughs> so, Peter, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I've hit the record button off. Um, yeah. But massive thank you for 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 coming on on the podcast and sharing your life with us. Yeah. To everybody at home, could you please like and subscribe so we can bring you more good content like this and click the notifications bell. That would be wonderful. For everyone that supported us on Patreon, massive thank you. To those at uh, Hunter level and above, you're going to see your name in the credits now. So a thank you to you. And we'll see you next time.